When most of us think about dopamine, we think about reward signals. But new research from Northwestern Medicine has found that there is one genetic subtype of dopamine neurons that do not respond to rewards at all and instead fire when the body moves. These findings, recently published in Nature Neuroscience, not only offer fresh insights into brain function, but also pave the way for new research possibilities, especially concerning Parkinson's disease, a condition marked by a loss of dopamine neurons and motor system challenges. Here to discuss this research are two of the key Northwestern medicine investigators on the project, Dr. Raj Awatramani, the John Eccles Professor of Neurology, and Dr. Daniel Dombeck, Professor of Neurobiology in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Neurology and Neuroscience. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hello. So can you both tell me a little bit about your research broadly and how it relates to dopamine? Dr. Dombeck, do you want to start? Sure. A lot of my research is based on developing new technologies for uh, recording from the brain, new imaging technologies, new behavioral technologies to record from mice and different neuron subtypes in their brains as they're behaving. We actually came to work in the dopamine system almost through accident, I'd say. We were trying to pilot some studies using a new imaging technique in the hippocampus and things weren't quite working out how we were expecting. And so we thought we'd go to a brain region where things were better understood, where we could label dopamine neurons and look at their activity patterns. And we should see something that was understood based on the literature. And when we looked there with our new imaging technique, we saw something really new and unexpected. And so this has been a a deviation from the kind of traditional work in my lab. We weren't traditionally working in, you know, originally working in the dopamine system, but we came to it through the new technologies we were developing. What about you, Dr. Wadarami? Yeah, I started studying this since I came to Northwestern about 18 years ago. I originally started studying the development of dopamine neurons. So maybe more than a decade ago, we identified a very unique origin of dopaminergic neurons in the embryo. So we defined that these neurons originated in a structure called the floor plate that was not thought to give rise to neurons. And not only did in the midbrain the floor plate give rise to neurons, but they turned out to be dopaminergic neurons. And then during the course of the studies, I began to realize that these dopaminergic neurons, they don't just project to a single target. Some project to a region called the striatum, some project to the amygdala, some project to the cortex. And that made me wonder. They must have been different to begin with to get to those different targets. You know, the guidance cues and and, and the mechanisms to arrive at those targets must have been coded differently during development. And so there's some fundamental distinctions between these neurons. And that led me to start thinking about dopamine neuron diversity. And then, of course, it's already known at the same time it was being realized that these dopamine neurons have various different functions and are involved in very different diseases ranging from Parkinson's to drug addiction, which have nothing in common with each other. So that made me really start thinking more about dopamine neuron diversity. So here we have someone who's been studying this topic for 18 years and someone who kind of stumbled upon it. How did you two come to collaborate together on this study we're going to discuss today? So that was a very fortuitous circumstance. I happened to be taking the intercampus shuttle from Feinberg back to Evanston, And next to me was seated Dan. And I hadn't really, I I may have met him once before, but only cursorily. The the journey is about 40 minutes. And so during that time, I started, we started just chatting and seeing what each other's lab were up to. And then it turns out I was interested in dopamine neuron diversity from the molecular angle. And he was starting to gather preliminary data on dopamine neuron heterogeneity from the functional angle. And so by the end of that journey, we thought, oh my God, this could really come together nicely as a potential R01. And so a few months later, that's what we did. We, we wrote an R01, which eventually was successful. Now, this is the true definition of a happy accident, I guess, or the water cooler talk that really turns into something. How long ago was this bus ride? Yeah, I think it was 2016. 2016, yeah. Incredible. Well, before we get into these latest results, just give me an overview of what was generally accepted knowledge of dopamine neurons prior to this study. So, you know, I think the 
popular press view, like the sort of general public view of dopamine, when you think about dopamine, you usually think about reward signals. You think about that hit of dopamine you get when, you know, you win your favorite video game or you eat a good piece of chocolate cake or something like that, right? I think that's what people often think about when they think about dopamine. But we also know that when dopamine neurons die, people have trouble moving. This is exactly what happens in Parkinson's disease. And so this has really been sort of a mystery for, you know, why there's these differences and the idea that dopamine neurons are reward related comes from recordings that were done by some scientists, uh, Wolfram Schultz and colleagues back in the 1980s, where they stuck electrodes down into the midbrain where these dopamine neurons reside in non-human primates. And I think they were originally expecting to see motor signals because it was certainly known at the time that, you know, about Parkinson's disease and the death of these neurons lead to motor problems. And what they found instead were predominantly reward-related signals. When the monkeys received unexpected rewards, they saw big bursts of signaling in these neurons and you know, not very much motor-related signaling. And so that was pretty confusing. And it's led to what we often refer to as the dopamine paradox ever since, which is that if those neurons die, people have trouble moving. But when we record from those neurons, they seem to respond to rewards. So how, how, where's that you know, difference coming from? That's what I'd say a lot of what was known before our work. So let's talk a little bit about your work. You tagged, you and your team tagged neurons in the brains of genetically modified mouse models with fluorescent sensors to see which neurons control different specific functions. So tell me about this approach and what you were able to find. So we use a molecule called GCAMP. It's a genetically modified fluorescent protein that can be expressed through genetic means in specific neuron subtypes. I'll let Raj explain in, in a few minutes exactly how we get those different subtypes labeled and how we make those genetically modified mice. But for the recording side of things, we label these different groups of dopamine neurons with this GCAMP molecule. And when neurons fire action potentials, calcium comes into the cells and this molecule binds to that calcium and it gives off a burst of light. And so we can then use optical tools, basically light as a readout for neural activity and we can then stick optical fibers into the brain and record these bursts of light to know when the different neuron subtypes are actually active and responding to, to stimuli. And one of the things we've pioneered in my lab is this ability to do these recordings in behaving mice while they're behaving, running on a treadmill, for example, and receiving rewards. And so we can look at these responses of different dopamine neuron subtypes in relation to movement of animals and while they're receiving unexpected rewards, the two things that dopamine neurons you know, are, are thought to be involved in and try to tease out when the neurons are active with respect to those different behaviors. Raj, tell me a little bit more about that and the role that your team played in identifying these genetic subtypes. This started about a decade ago, and you know when I first started getting interested in the heterogeneity of dopamine neurons, and back then we used more crude techniques to separate out different types of dopamine neurons. Now in this study, we use more advanced techniques, the technique uh, pioneered by my graduate student, Zach Gartner. What he did is he developed a pipeline called single nucleus RNA sequencing, his pipeline allowed us to harvest large numbers of dopaminergic nuclei, which was previously not possible. And because he had such a large collection of dopaminergic nuclei, he, he could now use single nucleus transcriptomics provided by the core at Northwestern to group dopaminergic neurons based on their molecular signatures, based on their commonalities. You know, in this uh, study, we found about 15 different molecularly distinct dopaminergic neuron uh, subtypes. And then using that information, we could develop genetically targeted mice. I also direct the transgenic core at Northwestern. And so using the core facility, we were able to make a few different genetically targeted mice, which would allow access to only that subtype of dopaminergic neuron in an otherwise intact brain. And so using those genetically targeted mice, uh, we, we could now access these subtypes and look at, for example, their projections, which we did in our lab. But then we handed these mice over to Dan's lab, and he could introduce GCAMP viruses into these mice to study, again, that population in isolation. 
Well, tell me the results of this study. They were not what many would have expected. What did you find? Yeah, that's right. So several years ago, even before this study, we had found the unexpected finding that I was talking about earlier in our discussion here, that we found some dopamine neurons that were active when animals were running and not so much when they were receiving reward. And that was when against, you know, the recordings that were made in the primates, for example, it was a bit of a surprise, but it fit in with, you know, what we know about dopamine's role in Parkinson's disease, for example. But after that, a lot of people kind of went back to the way of thinking that most dopamine neurons still respond to reward. Maybe there's a small subset that have some motor activity, but by and large, dopamines are reward responsive neurons. And so it was really, you know, with these genetically modified mice that Raj's lab was developing that we could then really go in and ask, is there a defined subtype that is motor responsive and not reward responsive? Or is it true that almost all of the subtypes have this reward signal, and maybe some of them have a small motor signal. And what we found was that we found a specific subtype in the substantia nigra, part of the midbrain where dopamine neurons live, that makes up a pretty substantial fraction of the dopamine neurons there that was active when the animals were running and did not seem to care at all when the animals were receiving reward. So here was a motor responsive dopamine neuron subtype, not responding to un unexpected rewards that is defined genetically based on expression patterns that Raja's lab had found. And so we, we really isolated this subtype and that was that's a very important component of the study of what we found. This is something that people have been chasing really for decades. And what was the reaction of your peers in the scientific community when the study came out and that you were able to finally identify these specific neurons? It's very recent, the paper coming out. I think we were, Raj and I were at a meeting recently and a lot of people were very interested. The scientific community is usually pretty slow to adopt big changes and new ways of thinking. And I think it's going to take some time for people to adopt what we found and sort of bring it into their way of thinking. But I think people are generally quite excited. And, you know, someone at one of these meetings recently said that we've sort of changed the field in a way that everyone's now going to have to go back and redo their experiments based on different subtypes. You can't just think of dopamine neurons as one homogenous group now. People are going to have to go back and look and ask, well, what do dopamine subtype was being recorded for that type of experiment or this type of result, et cetera. And so that's the sort of change that's probably coming. Well, and let's talk a little more about that correlation to Parkinson's disease, which is characterized by loss of dopamine neurons and motor system challenges. Raj, can you explain this to me, this correlation and what this could mean for people who are investigating this disease? So very simply, the medical textbook would tell you that the substantia nigra degenerates in Parkinson's disease, really leading to less dopamine in the striatum. That's sort of the dogma in the field for the last 50 years. Now, what this work is adding to it is that there's different types of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, and they have different properties, some of which are correlated to locomotion. And it turns out, by the location of that population, we can surmise, based on other studies that we and others have published, that those are the populations, the, the subtypes of dopaminergic neurons that degenerate during, in Parkinson's disease. And so it's a sort of new way of thinking about Parkinson's disease that we're focusing on that the disease is likely a result of the loss of these pro-locomotor, if you will, dopaminergic neurons, rather than just a sort of a loss of all dopaminergic neurons. And it has implications for the treatment of disease because what it says is that not all dopamine neurons are degenerating and the remaining ones when you treat patients with levodopa, those remaining ones are intact and they may, at least in part, be the result of some of the, the unexpected or the adverse effects of levodopa. I was just going to add that I focused mostly on the subtype that is motor correlated and not responding to reward, but there's other subtypes that we recorded from and Raj was hinting at other subtypes that are more resilient in the disease and, and remain. And one of the interesting findings that we made was that those resilient dopamine neurons, those subtypes, some of them also had motor-related signals, but they were more active when the animals were decelerating or stopping rather than accelerating or starting to move. And so one of the implications, potential implications of that difference is that if it's the acceleration movement driving 
population that's dying first in the disease, then this resilient population is the one that might be involved in driving stopping movements, then there's sort of an imbalance that's left over between the system. Instead of having one population that can drive movements, another that might be you know, driving stopping signals, what you're left with it then is this sort of deceleration stopping related population that might be making the disease worse and worse as the, that imbalance progresses. Raj, could this be guiding your future research into Parkinson's disease? And could there be any implications for any other neurodegenerative diseases that affect motor function? So first of all, uh, it allows us to hone in on, on specific subtypes of dopaminergic neurons. And now we can begin to inquire what makes these different. Now we know their transcriptomes, we know their genetic signatures. We can begin to start to think what makes these ones degenerate. So that's a clear implication. The second implication is we can start to query, are these different subtypes parts of different circuits? Do they have different connectivities? Do they have different inputs and outputs? And that's something our team is actively investigating. As to the question about different dopamine-related diseases, yes, not neurodegenerative diseases, but there are many diseases associated with dopamine one of which we're studying is opioid addiction. And we are trying to elucidate populations of dopaminergic neurons that may be particularly responsive to opioids or that may be driving the withdrawal symptoms seen in opioid patients. And this is being done as part of a separate collaboration with the Center for Pain at Northwestern, driven by Vanya Abkarian. In many ways, this paper should be viewed as a starting point. Tell me about some of the different aspects that still need to be fleshed out. Our current recordings were bulk recordings, and Dan's lab and other members of our team are starting to look at this at more at a single axon or at a single cell level in terms of the function. Dan's lab is also looking into stimulating these neurons to see if you can drive uh, locomotion, and that's turning out to be quite interesting. So it's leading to a lot more new avenues of research. Just to add to that, all of our findings were made in mice. And the disease, the implications that, that it has for humans, it's still far away, right? And so there's a lot that needs to be done to try to translate these results to first possibly to primates and then, and then to, to human primates. And, and so it's tempting to think of the direct connections between what we've done in the dopamine system in a mouse and try to make direct connections to the human disease. But a lot of work needs to be done to fill in the gaps and make sure that the mouse system is not just fundamentally different in some way, which is still a possibility. This all started with a bus ride to Evanston and R01, and then you were able to get more funding, NIH funding, foundation funding. Tell me about the support that you've had for this project and support that you're hoping to get going forward. After the NIH grant, we had acquired quite a, a lot of interesting preliminary data. And so we decided to apply for the Aligning Science Across Parkinson's Disease grant, which is a large grant. It's a team grant. And so we formed a team at Northwestern and beyond. So there's a few investigators, including Mark Bevan, Lucia Persiadu, Jim Sermeyer at Northwestern, and Tom Nasco at uh, UCSD who form part of our team. And so we wrote this grant. And even though we, we don't come into this field as Parkinson's disease experts, me being a developmental biologist and Dan being interested you know, in the functionalities of dopamine neurons, but the foundation found this work very compelling and therefore they funded our grant. And we're very excited to be part of this larger network of PD investigators. And when we go to those meetings, we hear about different aspects of this disease, uh, which we are not studying, but it adds to our sort of understanding and it, it sort of helps us put our work into the context of that larger field as well. I want to point out that the paper's first authors are both graduate students in both of your laboratories. Tell me about these extraordinary young people that you have working with you and the roles that they've played. I think it's pretty remarkable that they're both grad students. And if you look at the amount of work that went into to this paper, it's an extraordinary amount of work. And the quality of the data and the analysis that was done is just, you know, I think pretty stunning. So Maite Escora was the grad student. She was joint between our two labs. She built the 
optical system to do these recordings, develop the techniques to isolate the signals, make sure they weren't movement artifacts. And she was piloting all of the methods to label the neurons with different types of viruses. And it was great to see, you know, after what, four or five years of, of work, you know, I credit her and Zach for the lion's share of what went into the paper and the discoveries that were made. Zach Gartner was an MD-PhD student who joined my lab, I think, in 2018 or 2019. And a few months after he joined, the pandemic struck. And so he's sitting at home and very frustrated that he didn't have a good glimpse into dopamine neuron heterogeneity because the studies that had been published at that point, including one from our lab, had analyzed very few neurons. And so the first thing he did while he was sitting at home is he compiled all those studies into one data set and to increase the numbers. And that was moderately satisfactory. But then as soon as he was allowed to come into lab, he devised this new pipeline to extract larger numbers of dopaminergic neurons, and in this case, nuclei, that allowed him to get, gain a sort of much more granular view of the dopaminergic system. So yeah, between him and Maite, they, they did a fantastic job on this paper. As we wrap up today, what would you like to leave our listeners with? What do you want them to know about this discovery and what it could mean for the future? My take is that there's a, a lot of different dopaminergic neuron subtypes. We've just started this exploration and it's going to get more and more sophisticated and interesting. And ultimately, I hope that we even might be able to, based on the transcriptome of these individual subtypes, maybe there's channels on the subtype that are specific to that subtype or receptors, and then we could start treating dopamine-related diseases in a subtype-specific manner. That would be a great outcome of this work. I'd say from a neuroscience perspective, there's been a lot of conflicting results in the field of dopamine recordings, a lot of data that didn't quite make sense, you know, conflicting reports from different groups, things that should have looked similar. And I think a lot of clarity is going to come from this way that we've found to dissect the dopamine neurons into different subtypes and different groups that have different activity patterns. And this genetic means to access them is something that should be accessible to groups around the world. And so having that way of dissecting the circuitry is hopefully going to lead to some clarity and, and more consensus in the field about what these neurons do and what, they're, what diseases they're involved in and what activity patterns they're involved in. Well, thank you so much for coming today and explaining the results of this very exciting paper. And we look forward to the future and what's coming next. My pleasure. You can follow us on Twitter at NUFeinbergMed. Subscribe and ring the bell to hear about the latest groundbreaking research and discoveries. Thanks for listening.